Awesome. So uh, I'm going to build up on what Jason went through, but I've, I did a quick Twitter poll recently to find out if people still like these whole about me slides. So I figured I'd, I'd throw my own fashion into it these days. Um, I got back into networking about six years ago after spending a bunch of time talking about kind of cloud and a bit of software pieces, hybrid cloud, public cloud. And then I kind of looked around me again and realized that there were some interesting things going on in networking as automation was becoming a topic that folks talked about. And so I said, you know what, I think I've got something to add over there. So I jumped back into networking to kind of learn a bit about automation and all of these pieces and to help everybody else um, make the journey on their own. Now, all that said, I've been doing the automation thing for about six years, but I will never even imply that I'm anywhere near the best coder, the best automation person out there. I've been vastly impressed by what I've seen everybody do um, and contribute off to the community. I just enjoy being a, a member of the community that's out there that's doing all the automation. My day job currently at Cisco is I architect and design the networks behind the scenes of the DevNet Sandbox platform, as well as the platforms if you've ever taken a Cisco learning course to study for a CCNA or CCNP or the new DevNet associate exams. Um, and you've um, done any of those digital labs and the online pieces, we actually maintain the data centers behind those. And we've got data centers around the world with hundreds of racks and having to manage the connections of data center kit and collaboration kit and all of these other pieces. And so I recently expanded my role to help that team figure out how we can better operate and automate and kind of, let's call it net DevOpsify, um, what happens behind the scenes and all of those. So I don't do sales at Cisco anymore. And, and my advocacy is kind of like this, but in general, my day job is actually trying to figure out how to put all of these things into practice. So take a tool like Cisco NSO and say, how does this make my job easier as well as the job of the, the dozens of other network engineers that work on our teams as they go through? And so the use cases you'll see me talk about are actually tied back to the real environments and the challenges that we solve on a daily basis. I found myself with some free time uh, this year and picked up a couple of new hobbies, astrophotography. So I'm often outside late at night under the stars and playing with some woodworking out there. Um, if you want to contact me, um, my contact information is there, though I will admit to being slightly uh, quieter on social media lately. I'm too much time out in the garage. So I'm going to talk most of our demonstrations today about the DevNet Sandbox Network. And I call the DevNet Sandbox Network very much a multi-domain network. And that's an actual screenshot from our data, one of our data centers. And the components that go into it range from the things you might expect that you would call the network. Our Nexus switches, our um, catalyst switches in our management environment. But my network is also made up of routers. Um, Cisco iOS XE routers, we've got XR routers, we've got firewalls, both Cisco's next generation firepower platform as well as ASAs. We've got vCenter environments. Virtualization is a huge part of my network as are newer technologies like Kubernetes, um, server-based networks in there. And so when we sat down to figure out how do I wanna manage and control this network, I wanted something that would give me the ability to kind of target the entire network as a whole. Um, one of the key examples for me was the, the number of times I've had challenges because we, we roll out a new VLAN across the data center and we get it right maybe in the firewalls, we get it right in um, the Nexus switches, but it was missed in the server environment, our UCS platform, or it was the settings inside of vCenter on the port group weren't quite right. And so we've got this conflict as it went through. And I said, There's enough of that. I want one place, one, one way to control and configure our network as it goes through. And Cisco NSO gave us that, and it gave us that in a way that was programmable, but also, as Jason was demonstrating, looks and feels like a networking tool. So you don't have to jump. I didn't have to train all of my engineers from day one to know Python or be comfortable in YAML or JSON. I could give them a platform that kind of met their needs, but also integrated with everything else we needed in our systems. Now I'm going to talk a lot about services. Jason went through kind of the entry point, that network CLI fashion. And I talk about NSO a ton. It is hugely powerful at that level. But there's I want I wanted to spend some time talking about the other side of it. When you start to say, I want to craft and control my entire network as a thing, not a, a combination of a hundred devices that I have to manage individual configurations for. And this is where that concept of network services come in. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about three, depending on how much, how much time we have for the demos as we go in today. 
But the idea is across my data center, I have, I want to treat it like a fabric. And so we created a service called VLAN fabric that's composed of all of the switches, compute environments and virtualization um, that where I like to say a VLAN has relevance. And so if VLAN 100 means the same thing on two switches, they're part of the same fabric. VLAN 100 is, it means something inside of vCenter, a particular DV switch. It's part of the same fabric. So our VLAN fabric kind of combines all of these resources together. And then on top of those fabrics, I need to create a bunch of tenants. We have our administrative purposes. We've got our public facing services. We've got all of our reservation environments. So anytime somebody comes in and reserves a sandbox, you get put into a tenant and all of your things are isolated. And so that has to get laid on top of a fabric as it goes through. And then we have our firewall services that control access into each of these environments. And so we crafted and designed using NSO these services, and then that's what we use to interact with our data center. And so that's what the demos are gonna be about. It's gonna be this type of an environment and how do we control our data center through NSO using both the CLI and APIs um, as it goes in. I'm gonna flip back to this slide a little bit as I jump into the screen for the demos as it goes in. Before I start typing away at a CLI, any questions so far? Nope, I get nobody's coming in. So, all right, so this is our NSO environment. Um, I don't know if it's coming through in the Zoom really well, but you'll notice it says pre-prod up here. I'm pretty cavalier as a network engineer, but I am not working and doing the demonstration from our production data center. This is our pre-production where we actually run out and test things, applications and pieces. So it's a smaller sized footprint from our production environment. But if I do a show devices list, you can see that it's made up of quite a few devices. Um, both in pre-production and production, the vast majority of my devices are Cisco ASAs because every single environment reservation that somebody gets um, has an ASA that fronts it because that's where all the security goes through and VPN pieces. Um, in our production environment, we're, we're upwards in the thousands of ASAs that are controlled. You'll also see that we've got our admin, uh, admin firewall. That's a, a dedicated for administration. We've got our Nexus environments. We've got some iOS switches that are in place. And then we've got our vCenter. This is that magic. And we'll see this as we jump into some of the demos as well. I'm controlling my vCenter network settings um, from NSO, just like everything else, along with somewhere in here. Oh, there it is. UCS. So our server components as they go in on that. So let's talk about that services piece. Um, so if I go through and do a show running config VLAN fabric, and then we'll say internal. This is how we actually describe our data center topology. Now this one's a small one because this is pre-production. I'm gonna show, I captured out our production version in a second that I'll show. But the idea behind the services here is that I wanna be able to describe just the key elements of what it takes to build my data center. So I'll have switch pairs. In this case, there's only one in the pair, again, pre-production, but we've got our leaf switch. We indicate that this is gonna be a layer three leaf. What's the primary uh, of the pair? If there was a secondary, it would be listed. Fabric trunks, like how do all of these switches in my fabric connect, to e uh, connect together so that the VLANs can be passed? And then down here, you'll see our fabric interconnect. So this is Cisco UCS. And then which VNIC templates would kind of connect out to components that should be part of our fabric. The idea here is which, which VNIC templates represent the network adapters that go to all of our ESXi hosts. Because the idea is every time a network is added, ESXi has to have it plumbed down to it. And then specifically for ESXi, here's our, our vCenter. This DV switch is part of the fabric as well. So this is just combining together all of these components so that I can start to ma manipulate and manage um, uh, manage the networks that are there. I promised a look at kind of what goes through. So before I do that, so we've got this, right? This is what my network engineers have to say. Every time we add a new switch, they would go in here and say, okay, switch pair, give it the name, um, whether it's supposed to be layer three, and then where the, the trunk interfaces and things go. Um, this is then rendered by NSO into the full configuration necessary to set that network up. And so that's what I wanna look at now and kind of show that value when we move from device-based config management to a service-based model. And so if I bring up my code example here, so this is the same output from the command, but from our production environment. And so the thing I wanted to show here is you can see our switch pair. We have two of them in this case. 
um, where Nexus switches. So how are the where does where does the VPC relationship come? So we just articulate the key elements of the design. And then what NSO does is it renders out the full configuration. And the way it does this is through kind of building on that template concept that Jason showed in his demonstration, is rather than just being a simple template that has some DNS servers in it, it's a template that's combined together with some Python logic to figure out things like, well, what addresses should be used for the VPC keep alives? It goes through and my template knows, I didn't have to tell it I want jumbo frames. I just know it's my data center. I want everything jumbo, right? I don't wanna see a mini pack at any place. So every interface will be guaranteed to be jumbo because NSO will make sure it's that way. Um, the port channels get set up, all of the trunking is done kind of across the board. And so it's what we, we NSO is doing for me is taking this little bit of configuration to describe my fabric and then articulating that into the full configuration necessary to connect all of the switches, the compute and the vCenter environment together into a single kind of area where a VLAN can live. Um, we do that all the time. The interesting part is when we start to put VLANs into the network. So let's move forward. And we're gonna go now and talk about the networks themselves. And so if I go, let me bring uh, the handy slide back up. So we've got like the picture to look at. And so we looked at the VLAN fabric where we actually do more of our work is in what we call the VLAN tenants. And this is another service that we created. And when I say created it, we wrote it. It's some templates, configuration templates. It is Python that knows what to do with those config templates. And then it's the data model that controls the CLI that we're looking at right now. And that data model is written in Yang. Um, Yang is a scary topic sometimes for network engineers. Um, I don't wanna go super deep into it now, though if anybody wants to ping me on Twitter and we can go into it. But for me, the, the knowledge around Yang is gonna be more, is gonna be in depth for uh, network engineers that focus on actually developing these templates and these services. The network engineers that are kind of consuming them and using them to manage it, don't need to have a lot of depth of Yang knowledge. They're just gonna consume the output of those uh, on that side. But here, if we look, I've gone through and I've again done show running config VLAN tenant. Now the idea here is remember Jason and all of his show running configs were devices device because he was looking at the running config from an individual device. I'm looking at a running config from a service that represents what I want my network to look like, particularly the admin tenants. And then I'm just saying, show me the networks that are there. And so a network is kind of a layer two area in my environment. So it has a name. Um, we use VLANs inside of our data center um, rather than uh, VXLANs today. So our VLAN ID, what's the network prefix, uh, whether this network needs to have layer three control done as part of the fabric. And then you can see if we've got DHCP set up, we can say where the relay comes from. Um, we can also see down here in our admin main network, this is the only point where we start to point back into individual devices, is that if I have a network that needs to have a physical connection, a bare metal server thing um, connected to it, I need to tell our service, like, where does that have to be attached? And in this case, it's attached to this particular leaf pair on this interface 117, and I give it a description and a mode. And so this is what it takes to control networks. I, I can add dozens of more switches to my fabric, um, and these networks would just miraculously show up across the board because of the knowledge of the service, because we treat the data center in that way. Um, I'm going to get ready for the next one. Any questions so far before we actually see how NSO builds configs? All right, I'm going to jump into it. So let's say I wanted to add a new VLAN tenant. I would go or add a new network to my VLAN tenant. VLAN tenant admin, and then I would say network. We'll give it a name. Let's say I wanted to name it AAA NF, NFD. And then I can say, well, what else can I apply for my, my network that I'm going to add? So the question mark shows me that I can set route neighbor status. Should this ha actually develop route routing relationships across this network? I can have to give it the VLAN ID. So that's a mandatory one, I know. So VLAN ID, we'll call it, I don't know, 78. I think that one's unused. And then we'll give it a network, the actual prefix that's there. So 10, 78, 78.0 slash 24. All right, so that's the bare minimum necessary to create a network across my entire data center. And if I do a show config, we can see that all I've added was kind of like three lines of configuration. 
Now, if I wanna implement this, remember that two stage commit, I can go ahead and do a commit dry run. And I'm gonna say out format native, cause I'm a big fan of like, show me what, what's actually gonna be pushed to my devices. So if I do my commit dry format out or dry run out format native, and I scroll up to the top, we'll see this is everything that's gonna be pushed out across my network to make sure that this new network is added to the particular tenant and it connects together the fabric. So remember this tenant exists on a, on a fabric in the data center. That fabric includes a, a fabric interconnect pair. That fabric interconnect pair has a couple of different VNIC templates, particularly VM network A, ESXi trunk A and ESXi trunk um, A again down. Oh, these are in different orgs. So this is in the in one uh, UCS org, this is another org, this is another org. And so this is making sure that this new network, this new VLAN is added inside of UCS where it needs to be, and then also added down here to bring a new network in. On the leaf, we get our VLAN is gonna be added appropriately. And then I didn't have to specify details about an SVI, that's that part of the service that comes in. So my service knows if I want layer three, I need to go figure out which switch provides layer three services and then create a v, an SVI on it, make sure that it's part of the right VRF that corresponds to the tenant. I, it goes through and assigns and figures out what IP addresses to give to each of the switches in, um, that are there. And that's all done based on our rules. Our rules say that the first IP address in a prefix gets assigned as the HSRP address. And then the second and third would go to the, um, the two switches that are providing that service. Scroll down a little more, we can see our spine switch is also gonna get the VLAN added. And then down here in vCenter, these are the commands that NSO is going to use to make sure that this new port group gets created for that as well. And so we can see that's that, for me, that's the value of automation with services. As I simplify what my network engineers, my operators need to provide, three lines of I need a new network added to the data center, and then NSO extracts that into everything across the entire data center to keep them in sync as they go. Now this was all CLI. I actually, I'm gonna abort this change and we're gonna run this change through an API because that's actually how we do more of this rather than the CLI interface. But before I show that, are there any questions? Uh, oh, yeah, Hank. Yeah, hey. right, uh, I'm sorry, Warren. Um, uh, just a, a quick one. I, I watched you enter the information for VLAN 78, but I didn't see you make any reference uh, to the HSRP address and yet I see it there in the config. Um, so where is it sort of defined in your template to say that, that this layer three interface is going to be you know, highly available across multiple switches? Sure. So if we had more than like the 18 minutes left in here, I'd open up the code, show you the templates, the Python where it's all calculated. Um, that's where it's done. So there's three pieces that make up the service. There is the Yang model that defines the CLI and the API. And that's what I've been typing. That, those commands I type, that's, the, that's defined by the Yang model. There are the XML based templates that eventually get rendered into the final device configuration um, that are there. And we saw uh, versions of those that Jason was doing in his demo. And then there's the Python piece. The Python piece is where all of that magic comes in. So it's in Python that it goes through and it has access to everything that, the, that I've entered as part of the CLI configuration. And so for the, your example on HSRP, it knows that I said, here's a prefix. This is the prefix this network needs. My service code says, okay, well, this, this network needs layer three because that's the default setting. I could turn off layer three for a network, but the default is layer three is wanted. And that's in the Yang model. And then because layer three is wanted and I know the prefix that's been specified, my service rules inside of Python say, okay, well, go grab that prefix. What's the first IP address? That's gonna be the HSRP address. Great, what's the second IP address? assign that to the first SVI. What's the third IP address? Assign that to the, the second SVI on another switch if we had two of them. And so that's all done as part of kind of that Python code and logic. So it's, it's I take all of the business rules, the design things that my network engineers, the network architects say. I, I happen to also be the network architect for here. So when I had that hat on, I said, I want HSRP. And I, by golly, hate .254 gateways, so it's going to be .1 is the gateway. I'm stamping that into the design. And then the, first, the next available IP and the one after that go to my actual SVI interfaces. So the architect defines that. And then the service designer, that network automation developer, just builds the code to enforce that. Does that answer the question, Tony? 
Uh, yeah, Hank, uh, Hank, thanks. Appreciate it. Perfect. Awesome. And I think there might have been another. Yes. Uh, hi, Hank. So uh, we are looking at the NSO from the CLI. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we see anything on uh, graphical user interface as well? On the, the user interface, like the GUI? Yeah. Oh, we can. Um, oh, let me do this. No, no, no. Just uh, I am wondering, and uh, is there uh, any future parity, like um, difference? I can do many things on the CLI, but not much on the uh, GUI, etc. Or exact same, uh, same thing, same capabilities on both. Yep. So it's a good question. So I, I will say this, and I'll imagine Omar might want to jump in as well. But I'll give you my view as a user of NSO. Um, NSO comes with a web interface. You can I could browse to the web page. I could log in with my credentials. And it gives you a user interface that, that is decent, but it's not designed to really be a go-to user experience for NSO. NSO is much more typically used through the CLI or through the API and called in from other orchestration tools that are out there. Um, now you can build like decent user experience and workflows into the GUI, um, and there are demos for that. We actually did one of those at a, a previous network. I think it was a cloud field day or tech field day where we showed how we could use build templates and workflows into the GUI. Um, I honestly almost never open up the NSO GUI for our production systems because we I do it like this, or I do it like we're going to see in the next example that I'm going to show is in the um, through the APIs. If I end up with some extra time at the end here, I've got one more demo. I want to finish this this workflow through. I can open up the GUI and you can see it. It's it's okay. I mean, it's nothing fancy. There's buttons where you can do things like make config changes if you want. You can look at the configuration transaction history, which actually is handy. If you wanted to roll back something from like two weeks ago, that's much easier to do, I think, through the GUI than it is through the CLI um, on those pieces. But there is one. I just wouldn't say it's it's one you would typically use. Yeah. And, yeah, if you go back to the, uh, te I think, Tech Field Day 20 archives, uh, we actually have one of the TMEs go through a, a walkthrough of, of the GUI. But uh, Hank's spot on. Typically, most users are either doing things at the CLI or they're driving things programmatically and using some other tool um, to, to drive things. The, the GUI is accessible. It's, you know, a lot of times it's transitional for folks that are getting used to things or are, you know, for casual users or, you know, people that just want to be able to run config check syncs and stuff and have, you know, kind of canned operator type of operations. That's where the GUI typically uh, comes in. All right, so to, to kind of round this out, so we saw me adding or, or what it would look like from the CLI, but I promised some API pieces. And so I'm switching over here to Postman. So NSO provides a couple of northbound APIs. Um, there is a REST-based API, but it's also REST-conf because that is kind of the standard REST API for the network. It also provides NetConf. And there were some previous kind of older versions of a REST API that were out before the REST-conf was standardized. But today, I think most people say, just use REST-conf. That's the better interface to use if you want a, a, an HTTP-based API. And so what I've got here is I've got a, a kind of prepped in Postman a put request because I want to add a new network into a tenant. And then we can see the URL will look, it should look very similar to what we saw inside of the CLI. So it's VLAN tenant, admin, network, and then what's the name of the network? And it's because the Yang model that drove the CLI is also driving all of the API interfaces as well. And so if you've typed out a CLI command, the URL for that in RESTConf is almost the exact same thing, but you'll replace spaces with slashes or maybe an equal sign if it's a key value. But it's pretty easy to transition between the CLI and like the REST API. In this case, the body is being done in JSON format. So rather than just clear text CLI view, this is the, the native kind of modeled out version of the data that goes along with this network. And so what's the name of, or we're creating a new VLAN tenant network. The name of it is going to be AAA NF or AA NFD demo. Here's the VLAN ID and here's the network that I put in. Um, it's AA so that it shows up at the top of the list when I go ahead and commit this. So I'm going to send this API off. And then I'm going to flip my screen back over here. And we're going to look inside of our my vCenter environment. And I'm going to babble here for a little bit until we see the network start to come through. There it is. So we see we got an add distributed port group. And it should, there it goes. So once it refreshes, I put double A's at the top so it shows at the top of the list in the demo. And so here's the new port group's been added. 
If I go look over here in UCS, also at the top of the list, the new VLAN was added to UCS. And if I went and drilled into the VNIC templates, we'd see it's also been attached to the VNIC templates appropriately. And then just to kind of round out all of the pieces, if I log into the leaf that's part of the fabric, I'm always gun shy typing my password during a webinar because I usually don't get it right the first time. VLAN brief. So in here somewhere, I gave it, what was the VLAN number? Seven, oh, 700. Down here is where it was added. And so we've gone ahead and kind of pushed that out and the API did it. If I wanted to pull those off, so we've now seen that it's all there, I can go ahead and just do a delete request for that, that same piece. And so in this case, one of the things I like about REST APIs working with them is that the URLs are almost always the same between whether you're trying to update something, create something, or delete it. And so the URL we used when we did the put request was VLAN tenant admin network and then its name. To delete it, it's the exact same URL. We just changed from a put because I don't want to put something new. I actually want to delete this. So the, UR the, um, the method is just changed to delete. I go ahead and send that off. We can go over here and watch again. We'll see it disappear from here and then also disappear from here as well. I'll just do a include NFT. So it's already gone at this point. So we see it didn't pop up when I did my uh, request. It's disappeared from UCS. It's also disappeared here on this side. And so that's a really handy part of the way that these things go through. Now, the last piece I want to go, or the last demo that I've got time for, and I wanted to leave some time for some other questions and dialogue, was a big part of NSO when you get to large scale, or any automation, when you get to large scale um, network automation in, in an environment, is kind of trying to map back configuration ports to why it's there. And this isn't new. I mean, we've all got firewalls where we look back at them and they're a thousand ACL lines long, and you don't know what that ACL line was for. And so how do you know what was this part of the device's configuration put there for? And when is it okay to take that part of the device's configuration out? And that's another piece that NSO um, does for you when you start to connect them together with these services is because every part of the configuration that was added to a device because of a service is recorded. And so that you, you can be confident about which parts of the config can be pulled out when. And so if I do a show running configuration and we'll look at, what do I want to look at? We'll do devices, device, uh, leaf, uh, leaf 01 config. And then I'm going to do display service metadata. So I'm going to include not just the device configuration. I want to show all of the kind of the reference metadata that's also stored inside of NSO for it. And it's, it's not the easiest thing to read, but it's not intended for us to read. I'm doing it more as like a trust so we know that they're there. And so if you look in here, these lines with the exclamation points are just the way that they're being rendered to the screen. And so we can see that ref, ref count two and then back pointer is indicating that the next line in the config is there because of a reference to some service. In this case, it's a reference to two different things in the database. And it says that specifically this service, VLAN fabric, VLAN fabric name internal, wants to make sure that LACP is turned on on this switch. That's why it's there. If I look at something like an interface, let me find them in here. Well, here you can see all the VLANs. So we know exactly which service created every one of these VLANs. And then when we get down into the SVIs someplace, actually the VRF might be more interesting. Where is it, where is it? All right, so here we can see that this VRF was created. It wasn't created for no reason. It was created because the VLAN tenant called admin needed it. And so this allows NSO to know which ports of the configure there for what. And so two years down the road, when somebody's going through trying to remove configuration elements, there's confidence because NSO actually does most of the heavy lifting for you. Because if I were to ever go delete VLAN tenant admin, it would just go through the entire configuration across the network and pull out every part that was there because of that VLAN tenant. Now, suppose there was a part of a configuration that was in there because of two different VLAN tenants. Um, I know I have them, I just don't know where they are in the config, so I can't find them right now. 
But if I had, suppose, an interface that was configured to be a VLAN trunk, but it was used as part of two different networks, well, it would maintain its trunk status until both of those networks were removed. It wouldn't let you remove that until everything that required it was pulled out. This for me is a huge part of kind of tracking at scale the, the size of our configurations is because our configs start small, particularly in automation. Our templates start small, we don't need a lot. But over time, as more and more things go through, as your, your playbook runs grow, as your consumption and, and tickets and requests from the server team grow, it's important to be able to track back, like why was that put in? And if you're if a tool like NSO isn't doing it for you, then it's up to somebody else to figure out how do we keep track of all of these pieces? It's very easy to, to fall back into that state of, well, I don't know why it's there. It's safer just to leave it there until we kind of replace this data center or this site. That gets really hard, um, particularly in environments like mine where we, we actually start to push the limits of things like TCAM counts and how many ACLs can we have. Um, I can't just leave things extra in there because one of the scale numbers I use is like, how much TCAM space do I have? So how many reservations can I cram into a particular data center? Leaving stuff around is tough for us. So it's, it's important to keep that cleanliness. Yeah. So what's your source of truth here from a keeping up with stuff, you know, uh, networks, VLANs, et cetera? Where am yeah. I pulling that in and putting, and putting it back? Yep, good question. So you saw me in the demos today kind of type by hand. That's, that's not where they come from. We use um, Netbox in the back end that tracks all of our VLANs, our tenants, our switches, our ports, what the assignments are supposed to be. Um, that's all done in Netbox. And then we've got automation that reads the information from Netbox and then crafts the actual NSO configs. So for much of our data, the source of truth is actually Netbox, but the implementation, the enforcement of that source of truth um, is all pushed out through NSO. So we've got workflows that just keep the NSO CDB in sync with what NSO says the network is supposed to be built as. Um, oh. uh, Hank and, uh, and Cisco team, um, is there a particular uh, network design where this kind of software is most beneficial? Um, like I, I'm trying to, trying to make the correlation on where I would apply this in some of my customers' networks. And I don't see it being sort of directly applicable or, or a huge time saver. So I, I see like you're working with virtualizations, uh, multiple switches, maybe a leaf spine, uh, some stuff like that. Is, is that where this is most applicable or? I would say anywhere you're trying to automate, something like NSO is applicable. Um, the value of any automation tool, NSO included, increases as, things like standardization of platforms, um, removal of uh, the ability to create standards and repeatable processes. That's, that's the part you need for automation to be useful. It's not the number of devices, it's not a particular topology, it's not data center or WAN, it's how, how clean is the design getting to? Um, that for me is, is long been the part that gets me from looking at automation at something that can be useful for a couple of scripts and operational pieces, and then to go big, to truly kind of manage the, the entire config, build services, repeatable pieces, it comes down to that. Is, is it a clean design? Are there standards enforced? Um, is, it, is it a well understood process that can be articulated through some sort of a, an algorithm or template? That's what you need in order for automation to work. And, and did I hear you guys say early on that NSO is a, a multi-vendor? Oh my gosh. No? Yeah, hundreds. If there's a network vendor, it likely supports it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, they all, and if there's not, we can support it. So yeah, yeah. They, the the turnaround time for adding new vendors and new device types is pretty short, like six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah, six weeks weeks for a pack, <laughs> they'll usually do it. They can do it in about two weeks, but it wouldn't be considered like production support. It's, I think it's that six weeks number. So, so if you're trying to test something out for a customer. This is a this is a group of developers and a team, and I'll, I'll say as a customer of theirs, they are really responsive to making some of these fixes and adding things in. And, and, and one last thing is, uh, like you mentioned, um, uh, WAN uh, that this can be used uh, applicable wireless. This can be applicable, but then I sort of wonder why, like you know, why do we have the SD WAN dashboards and why do we have the the wireless management software? Sort of, if I have all this other management software. Uh, that does configuration, backup, sort of it takes care of all that. Then do I need this as well? You know, does this, does this augment or does this replace? It's tools like NSO solve problems. 
um, sometimes problems can be solved in more than one way, right? So some environments may not need something like this. If you've got a tool like a, a network controller that's handling all of these things for you already, and that's all you need, right? It's, it truly has everything that you're after, then maybe you don't need something like this. More often than not, a network controller will control a domain of the area, and then you need to integrate with some other domain that's out there, or you need you want to connect together with some other source of truth, and you need to link into these other areas. Um, oftentimes, it's more than just what's capable in one single domain tool that's there. Frankly, NSO for me is not the only thing we use. The majority of our configuration is stored out of NetBox, as I mentioned, and then we have other orchestration tools that actually drive our applications that go out. Um, as engineers and designers are figuring out what tools to use, you've got to figure out what's my domain of problems and then which tools solve those with the least number of tools possible. I have yet to come up with an environment where one tool is the number I get to. It's usually closer to like three to five tools when I, when I do them kind of with the customers and the types of things I look at. So. From a practical perspective, people own those different domains and they're in different organizations and they have tools they like, right? So you know, part of the thing is to not come in there and try and rip someone's tools out of their hands, but say, okay, you, you do whatever you do to manage your SD-WAN. But someone, someone in the company needs to be able to stitch those things together to deliver a service or turn up an app or whatever. And this is where NSO really, you know, comes in the ability to stitch other people's tools together and have a cohesive, uh, you know, workflow. And we had a conversation about workflow in Twitter, but, you know, workflow or process or, or turn up. And um, that's typically how we see it rolled out, right? NSO will use manage some things directly and it'll interface with other, other domain controllers you know, at the same time. So quick question, I've got, uh, I've got the evaluation page up here, it looks really good. But if we go beyond the evaluation, what's the average buy-in for this? I'm not sure how we would measure, you mean in terms of what's our adoption? No, what's, a, what's the cost to get a production environment in place? Like how do we order it? Is, are we talking four figures, five figures, six figures? It kind of depends on how big your network is. Um, not a sales guy or a marketing guy, so I can, can, don't have an answer for you. But so licensing is, so I'll tell you what, licensing is based on basically three things. Uh, whether you're running um, single server or high, you know, high availability, uh, which is kind of the minimal cost. The big things are the number of NEDs, the number of devices, uh, you know, vendor slash platforms you're running and right to manage. So basically the number of devices you have. So a hundred devices is less expensive than a thousand devices, uh, which seems very logical. No, is, is there a, a minimum number of nodes to get in? There, there isn't, but you know, it's it's probably not cost effective if you need to manage like three nodes. I mean, someone, no. someone asked a question about, you know, Ansible versus NSO. I think our position is if you're doing basic stuff, you need probably, Ansible is as good a place to start as any. You know, for the simple stuff, everything you know, everything works. The more, the more complicated you get, you cross domains. You want to, you know, have these complex services you're rolling out. Um, then it starts to make a, you know, make more sense. Um, and it's a powerful tool, but I'll be honest, it has a steep learning curve, right? So uh, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a time versus investment in, investment thing. We're, you know, we're doing things on the learning curve side. Uh, Jason specifically is doing things on the learning curve side uh, to, to you know make it you know value out of the box uh, is it, faster. But um, yeah. there's a lot of power, but it's you know it's you know there's a little bit of investment involved. Yeah, it was actually along those lines. I was thinking about that earlier, Hank, when you showed um, this is the commands that you're putting in there, and that's what actually is going in there. And I'm kind of thinking, what's really the behind the scenes? What did you have to do to get to that point? that it was a usable system. Because I'm thinking, you know, when you look at network automation, if I have two switches I have to modify, it's easy enough to just write it out in notepad, copy and paste. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, one of Jason's, I think the last slide Jason had was that network CLI help you today, network API help you tomorrow. Um, I started my journey with NSO is a couple of years, um, and I very much started on the network CLI side, creating CLI based templates, using it for that. And the entry point for that was really easy, really low. Um, but the sophistication wasn't what I showed today in the demo where we've got like three lines and then that blows up into kind of configurations across vCenter and UCS and these other areas. Um, to get to that point, right, I had to have some knowledge around XML. I needed to have Python skills ready to go and understand the libraries that were there. And then I had to kind of take away the prejudice around learning more about Yang to describe the data model. 
Um, I would say if, if you sat down and you wanted to go from zero to writing services like that, um, you're going to have to invest a couple of months to build some skills, learn the pieces that are there. Um, but it's not insurmountable, I think, for anybody who, if they're already kind of considering themselves the skills they're learning as well, I'm, I want to be writing Ansible roles. I would say if you're at the spot where you're starting to construct Ansible roles, build data models and abstractions across like full configurations, um, moving into the network service design like we showed today is, is very similar, right? Instead of all YAML, it's going to be some XML, it's going to be some, uh, some Yang pieces, but it's that same type of like uplift of skill requirements necessary.